Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, going to give a talk on balloon pulmonary angioplasty for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Um, what is balloon pulmonary angioplasty? Well, it is percutaneous transluminal angioplasty performed in the pulmonary arteries. And here's a great picture demonstrating a subtotal obstruction of a right lower lobe pulmonary artery and the uh, immediate post-treatment angiographic result after opening that with a balloon. So it is a standard endovascular procedure using standard endovascular equipment. There are angiographic lesions which are selected by the interventionalist. A wire is eventually negotiated across the lesion. The lesion is treated with a balloon and that should hopefully increase the flow. So where does BPA sit in the current algorithm for the treatment of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? Well, at this stage, pulmonary endarterectomy is uh, the gold standard. And most patients who are deemed to have operable disease should probably have this operation. For those patients who don't uh, have operable disease, they're um, uh, usually triaged to medical therapy. And in this day and age, it's probably with or without balloon pulmonary angioplasty, depending on centres who have um, BPA experience. So the keys to a successful uh, BPA procedure, like any other uh, procedure, patient selection is probably the most important thing. And for BPA, this usually comes via an MDT discussion, review of the appropriate imaging, and review of patients with lesions that might be amenable to having BPA. Pulmonary angiography is performed. That, that can be performed via jugular or femoral access. Personally, I like to perform interventional procedures through the left internal jugular vein. Uh, for these sorts of procedures. Um, anticoagulation um, is continued. It doesn't necessarily need to be stopped. And therapeutic heparinization is probably also given in the procedure. The lesions are selected for BPA and they're treated with a modified angiographic balloon angioplasty technique. And really this incorporates a change in the end point of the actual intervention. So the initial treatment endpoint is actually just to reduce the vascular resistance rather than achieving a perfect angiographic revascularization. So all the interventionalists out there must resist the oculostenotic reflex because if you treat with a tiny balloon, it still looks horrible afterwards. But what you can't see is the effect you've just had on the peripheral vascular resistance. This also limits the high pressure injury to the downstream lung. So the way that we do this is basically to be very conservative with our balloons using undersized balloons. And we stage the treatment over multiple lesions, multiple segments in the, in the arteries, and multiple lungs. Post-procedure monitoring is required because there are potential significant complications. That can be perhaps sending the patient to a high dependency area first, and maybe later to the ward, depending on the uh, individual patient and procedure risk. There are severe risks, including rip perfusion edema and hemoptysis, which can be life-threatening if severe and are specific to this sort of procedure. Usually about three, but maybe up to 10 sessions or angiography sessions might be required. Usually it, the intervals can be quite close together. And this is necessary to reach all the lesions that you may wish to target and achieve all of your hemodynamic goals for that patient. It obviously depends on the extent of disease in each patient as well as operator skill. So here's the def definition of CTEF. It's a rare severe form of pulmonary hypertension and it's characterized by obstruction of the pulmonary vasculature by chronic organized thrombi. It leads to increased pulmonary vascular resistance, progressive pulmonary hypertension, and eventually right heart failure. It is a dual disease process consisting of obstruction to the pulmonary flow in the proximal and large vessels, as well as microvascular remodeling in the small vessels. It has significant morbidity and mortality with poor prognosis if untreated. As I've said, for patients who are deemed operable, they should get pulmonary endarterectomy. Some of patients are not operable for various reasons, and the best treatment for those patients is still being worked out, but really it should be targeted medical therapy with or without BPA currently. So these are the lesions that we're actually treating. This is the chronic organized thrombus with fibrous intimal hyperplasia and multiple small recanalized channels. This is a intra intravascular imaging technique called optical coherence tomography. It's like IVIS on steroids. And you can see the partially recanalized channels inside the vessel. 
This is the effect of putting a balloon inside the artery. You're performing dissection in a controlled manner, just like any other dissection or balloon angioplasty performed in other vascular beds. So both pulmonary endarterectomy and BPA are mechanical methods of treating the large vessel obstructive component of CTEF. There is immediate hemodynamic normalization after PEA due to the on-block removal of the stenosis in the proximal pulmonary arteries. And similarly, BPA with staged improvements in hemodynamics by eliminating the stenosis in a, se in a sequential fashion in the segmental and subsegmental arteries. So what sort of lesions do we see? This is the typical kind of lesions that we might see, consisting of web-like lesions and stenoses. Some are easier to treat than others, ring-like stenosis, and a little web, which is an intraluminal filling defect in a patent lumen, and subtotal obstructions are all fairly easy to treat. Occlusions are much more difficult to treat, and then we have tortuous subsegmental vessels, which are also difficult to treat and probably have the highest complication rate, and I suspect that's just due to the technical limitations of our endovascular devices versus the size of the vessel we're treating. So these are some more common web-like lesions in a patent lumen, so filling defects, longitudinal slit, a complex mesh, or maybe an abrupt narrowing at a vessel bifurcation. So if one was to do cross-sectional imaging in the middle of a procedure, this is a small, subtle web lesion inside a patent lumen. You can see that there is intraluminal echogenic or hypoechoic material with surrounding multiple partially recanalized areas at flow assessment. Here's the balloon which is being inflated and that's the angiographic appearance after balloon inflation which you can see there's improved flow down to the distal segment and subsegmental branches. So what is the effect of BPA? Well, it all really started in about 2012 when a number of Japanese groups published their experience and really made the rest of the world sit up and take notice. So these patients had good follow-up about two years at the time. They had significant improvements in their functional class after BPA. They had significant improvements in their hemodynamics. I was going to say this is normal, but now it's not. It has to be below 20. So, the, and significant improvements in their vascular resistance. So significantly high pulmonary vascular resistance with very big drops produced by the Japanese groups. Um, None of us in the rest of the world are really as good as the Japanese at doing this, but it just goes to show exactly what can be performed with this kind of treatment. Um, this was an article published uh, in a real-world CTEF centre in Japan. They didn't do very much surgery. They did treat 136 patients up until 2013, which was really just before the era of Rio Siguat, which was introduced um, as a result of randomised control data showing its benefit um, in non-operable CTEF patients. But a fair number of patients had been treated with uh, PTPA or BPA. Um, they were all selected based on typical uh, inclusion criteria that for patients that would be operated or treated with non-operable therapy. But I just wanted to draw your attention in the surgical group, they had respectable drops in pulmonary artery pressures as well as pulmonary vascular resistance. But the numbers with the BPA group were almost the same in their respective cohorts. Hence again, this is the six minute walk distance changes, significant improvements in six minute walk distance, both for um, BPA as well as surgical groups, as well as BNP levels. So this is not meant to really be a comparison of BPA versus surgery, but I guess what it shows is that for patients who were ultimately selected out of surgery, um, they had excellent um, outcomes as a result of this intervention without any dedicated or targeted medical therapy that was given at the time. Remember, there was no Rio Siguat in these patients. Um, this just goes to show the improvements in the uh, functional class distribution. So what are the complications of BPA? Well, there are the standard endovascular complications. That would be wire trauma or damage from the angiographic balloon or device. This typically results in vessel perforation, um, dissection, and flow-limiting dissection. In addition, something that is particular to the lung is this damage to the lung parenchyma. This is thought to be a reperfusion injury, 
which manifests as edema and is associated with higher pulmonary pressures. This may lead to life-threatening bleeding, hypoxia and mortality. The Japanese and Western groups demonstrate that there is definitely a learning curve to performing safe, successful and repeatable um, stage balloon pulmonary angioplasty. So this is an illustration of some of those complications. Here you can see some extravasation of X-ray contrast following a BPA procedure and you can see a wire has probably passed all the way out into a small vessel. Here you could see there is extravasation around the vessel which has just been treated with a balloon. And here you could see a flow limiting dissection with an accumulation of contrast that continues to stain in the area where, where there's no flow. This is the appearance that you might see for patients who have a significant reperfusion injury. It can go from minor changes which are really clinically not significant to severe changes requiring assisted ventilation or ECMO support. So for these patients, it has been shown that reperfusion or this high pressure injury is really associated with patients who had worse hemodynamics to begin with. So patients who are sicker, patients who have higher pulmonary pressures, patients who had a more complete angiographic recanalization, hence the urge to resist the oculostenotic reflex and tended to occur earlier in their staged treatments. So there has been some accumulating literature over the last few years, but it has basically shown that there is now um, significant improvements which have been demonstrated by multiple groups, but particularly the Japanese groups in hemodynamics, in symptoms, and in exercise capacity after BPA with low rates of major complications and post-procedural mortality. There is evidence that BPA also leads to improvements in right ventricular function and remodeling. Um, BPA salvage has been described in patients who have deteriorated after PEA. And <clears throat> there are, despite significantly worse hemodynamic parameters at baseline, the patients with CTEF who were managed with interventional therapies have definitely done better than those who were managed medically. The Japanese outcomes of PEA in operable patients and those of BPA in inoperable patients suggest that the efficacy and safety of both of these procedures are similar in their respective target cohorts. Although this has not been reflected by European experience, which is probably much better at surgery management of these patients. So once again, this is a recent um, uh, summary of so their French experience. There is definitely a learning curve. They've divided their a respectable number of patients who were treated for inoperable CTEF into their early period, the first 21 months, and the uh, later period, the last 21 months. And you could see the increases that they're able to produce with hemodynamics, um, as well as the amount of injury that they're causing has definitely improved over time. Um, basically, with BPA, um, the Japanese are performing extreme BPA. Their treatment goals are actually normalization of pulmonary hemodynamics as well as oxygen saturation. Uh, there is definitely a learning curve. They now try to treat as many vessels as possible in one hour after experience with 1,000 procedures. And there have been no serious complications in Japanese patients who have been treated in the last 700 procedures. Oh, okay. So um, I might say a few things and then just show a picture or two. Um, medical therapy versus BPA. Well, a recent meta-analysis has been performed and it has definitely confirmed that for patients who are undergoing BPA, the degree of improvements that are being shown are higher than what's being shown to medical therapy. However, the moderate, uh, only moderate quality evidence exists for BPA. Um, is there a role for B, um, <coughs> BPA versus pulmonary endarterectomy? Probably not, but I think there is definitely an overlap where smaller devices can reach um, where current large open surgical devices cannot. So in 2019, um, several teams have shown impressive decreases in pulmonary vascular resistance, improvements in functional status and in exercise capacity, improvements in RV function, sustained benefits of BPA in medium term retrospective analyses, and the procedure remains complex with a technical learning curve, but with an acceptable procedure related risk. Um, although BPA has yet to be prospectively evaluated, most leading CTEF centres have currently added BPA to their therapeutic options. 
ako ti myslíš.